Hello, my name is George English, the Director of Research Through People. Now what I want to talk about this time is opposed to researching your ancestors and where they came from and all those sort of things, to research the house that you live in. Quite often people come along and say, I live in this interesting old house, I wonder who lived here beforehand. So this, this video is about that and getting into it and we'll give you some examples of where we've done this for, for people who wanted to find out more about their old house and bring the former occupants to life because of course they were people with <clears throat> a background, with family, with things that happened to them. Now we talk about four factors in tracing ancestry. Particular factors are important in this case. So in terms of status, what we're looking at is someone who lived in that house. So either they were an owner or a tenant of the house. And records go with that because you live in a house, you may pay land tax, council rates and so on and so forth. You may be a voter, there may be an electoral role, but a record being kept of that person linked to the particular house. The normal records, registration and census may play a part. The census is taken and shows where the person lives and so forth. <clears throat> uh, and those may be particularly important. The parish registers were what was used before registration started. And then there's various types of document that may be relevant. Old maps may show us whether the house was there at a particular time or not. The deeds of the house, if they've been kept, can be very informative. There may be directories that keep a record, <clears throat> such as electoral roll. And then there are things like newspapers, where they may have a story about the people that live in the house. Uh, name, just as in researching people, clearly that's important. If we find the name of the person who lives there, it's a starting point. But again, if it's common or unusual, that will be a factor that will influence our researches. And finally, continuity. Lived in the same place? Yes, we're looking for someone who did live in that place. But we may find that, in fact, they moved to there from somewhere else. And, of course, they may have moved on, and we then get the next resident of that house. So what I'm going to do is show you three examples of this, which will give you a flavour of what may be involved, and particularly for something that you're thinking of doing yourself. So here we have the house Silverai in Ardrossan on the west coast of Scotland. Uh, on the coast, it's looking out over the sea, a lovely old house. Um, and what we've got here is an old photo. So this is North Crescent, where you can see a row of very nice old houses. A hundred years ago, there's the beach and the sea is just to the right of us. So here we have um, Ardrossan, there's the sea just off to the left, and here is North Crescent and you can see where Silver A is these days. Now the people we um, did this on behalf of, that they'd found out a little bit. They'd found out a bit about one of the early owners, and interestingly enough, he was a ship owner, living by the sea, there's a naturalness to that. Um, but one of the things we did first was, let's look back in the past. So that's Silver A today. Now here's North Crescent back in 1855, and you can see no houses then, one remote house, etc. But clearly the houses were built after 1855. And if we look at 1896, yes, there's a row of houses, including Silver Eye, <clears throat> in 1896. And you can see the big factor that influenced that, the railway. The railway came in most places in the latter half of the 19th century or the middle of the 19th century. And that meant people could live a long way away from their work. So on the west coast of Scotland, people could live in Glasgow and work on the west, work in Glasgow and live on the west coast, and that applied all over the country. And the maps show us here that the house must have been built in those 40 years. <clears throat> now, so we went to the census, and here we are, sure enough, in 1891, there's the house, and living at it is Hugh Boyd, retired ship carpenter, born in Irvine, quite near to Ardrossan, He's aged 66, and there's his wife, Margaret Boyd, or Gibson, possibly her maiden name, that may be helpful. And there they are, and in 1901, there we are again, uh, and Margaret is now a widow, so clearly Hugh has died in the 10 years between that. Um, and so we, we've followed up and we looked in the newspapers, and here, ship owner actually had an obituary in the Glasgow Herald in 1893, and we can read this. 
there he died suddenly at his residence. Um, he rallied and had a light meal and died. But 25 or 30 years ago, Mr. Boyd had several vessels engaged in the North American timber trade and also in trading to the West Indies. And at the time of his death, he owned the brigantine here engaged in the coasting trade. So we're starting to build up a picture. He's coming to life. Uh, Hugh Boyd, the ship owner who lived in this house. <clears throat> and again, further in newspapers, we found a report that he had a ship he bought was called the F.W. Cochrane in 1876. He then named it after his wife, Margaret Boyd. The newspaper articles found a couple said it had been outfitted by Messrs. Barr and Shearer. And then it was on the North Atlantic trade, went across to Canada and America, 1877, struck ice and was damaged. 1878, a mutiny by the crew and the ship was abandoned. And then in 1881, again it was abandoned on its way back from Canada due to violent hurricanes, a cargo of 217 standards of deals, anything expression they used to use for the number of uh, packages or uh, goods that the ship was carrying. And Hugh Boyd also lost another ship, the Annetta, in 1881. So it doesn't sound very good. Now, building up a picture of Hugh going back in time, in 1881, he was living in a hotel in Ardrossan, and we know he'd acquired the land for the property in 1877. This was in the deeds. So it may well be the family were living in the hotel while the house was actually being built. But we go back in time, 1871, he's a ship owner. 1861, he was just a carpenter. And the deeds actually show that the land was gifted to Hugh Boyd. And you wonder if he was someone who was a relatively humble carpenter and then got this gift of uh, land, property and, and maybe other things and became the ship owner. So the person is coming to life even more. And we then looked a little bit further and we found that Hugh had died in 1893. His wife, Margaret, died in 1901 and a directory showed the new owner. Alexander Bain was living at Silver Ray. So there immediately we've got a story that's growing up. So let's take another one, the other end of the country in London. And here's the Luff family, and there's Edward, and he had two children, John and Richard. And all of these grandchildren of Edward and great-grandchildren were ham dealers in the East End of London. And what we're going to do is look at John Luff in particular. You can see born 1807, so this is in the 19th century. And what I'm going to do this time, I'm not going to start with the house, I'm going to finish with the house because there's an interesting story here. And basically, John Luff and the family lived on Brick Lane, which was in Spitalfields in the east end of London. You may have heard of Brick Lane. It was very much of a trading street in those days. You can see this old photo showing all of the <coughs> stalls and so on and so forth and people busy buying goods. Now, we found in the 1841 census, in fact, then it didn't give the number of the house, it just said Brick Lane, and here's John Luff. His mother is living with him, Charlotte Lyles, she's still alive, obviously happens quite often. Elderly parent goes to live with son or daughter, and there is the family, and he's a ham dealer, as, as we know. Now, in 1856, John moved from 181 to 187 Brick Lane. He literally moved three or four houses down the road, and he died there in 1876. <clears throat> and number 181 that um, he moved from was then occupied by Self Samuel, a bootmaker. So again, a sort of trade. Now, what didn't help us here and took a while, we were looking for 181 and 187, and that was right at the end of the road, if at all. And then we found in 1883 that in fact the numbering had been changed. And so what was 181 became 77 and 187 became 65. Are those houses still there? Yes, they are. Are they still houses? Well, not really, no. Um, here is Spitalfields in 1872 and here's Brick Lane <clears throat> and various other streets. Trice Church, where the family were baptized and so on, quite a well-known church. A nicely designed one, etc. It's just around the corner. And here is what was then 181 and 187. So 181 was a house that John was living in in the first place. Let's have a look at what happened to them today. So the house they moved to, 65, is now an estate agent, and 77 is now an Indian and Bangladeshi restaurant. And in fact, Brick Lane is known for its, its Asian restaurants, etc.
And here was the La family able to go and have a meal at the Curry Bazaar where their ancestors had lived 150 years before then. And here we have Kittuck Side House, a nice old house. Um, goes back in time, probably built about early 1800s, but a wall at the rear dated 1610, so properties had been there for 400 years. Maps, again, very often we start with that, and here we find an old map, 1858, and here is Kittuck Side with a number of buildings. Well, let's look at it now. Well, here we are. Here are the buildings here, still there. The building at the back. This is the Kittuck Side one here. And you can see this building here. So quite often in rural settings, you find that the farms, some of the old buildings are still there. There may have been additions and so on and so forth. But we see here an area which hasn't changed all that much over the time in terms of the basic buildings themselves. Now, again, with research, we looked at the census. And here we have the Graham family. John Graham is the head, he's 69. His son, John, is a farmer. John's become a, a justice of the peace. Um, and in fact, there's John and his wife and his family. And in fact, I've highlighted in yellow three families because there's grandfather, son, and uh, grandfather, father, and Andrew, the son, all born in the East Kilbride area. I've also highlighted Patrick because we find, after I'd done this work, I then found someone else who also descended from the Grahams. But let's take the two Johns and Andrew and put them in a chart and a bit more about them. Andrew, we knew he became a merchant and what was interesting here, he went out to New Zealand in the 1860s. In fact, this inquiry started with the family from New Zealand wondering about their Graham ancestors. And there we have John and John, and we go back in time, we find that, that Rhoda, the, uh, Andrew went out to New Zealand, his daughter Rhoda was born in New Zealand, and it was in fact her grandson who contacted us. But going back in time, John Graham, that they're in this area, Kittuck Side, Lime Kills is very close by. And we found um, newspapers and other things, John nicknamed Parsnip Jock. And we found all sorts of things about the family. Lime Kilns House was very nearby. The Grahams introduced Ayrshire cattle into the area and married into other quite prominent families in the area. And I mentioned Patrick. Again, here we are. We found this um, Liz who was descended from Patrick. So she, she was delighted when we were able to share with her this information about her ancestors. So it's a real quite interesting stories I think about what happened and what happened here when the Graham descendants from New Zealand came over then we made contact with the current owners they very kindly showed them around but in fact the current owners got a lot of pleasure out of meeting descendants of people who'd lived there beforehand and of course the house had been extended in various ways since then so a win-win situation for both people and very often that's what happens people say can you find out more about people in my house but we may find, in fact, when we're researching your ancestors 100 or more years ago, we find out about the property and we can make contact with those living there at the same time. So, delighted if you would like to get in touch and for us to do more work either <coughs> on your house or, or on your family. Um, we do a free consultation, so if you give us information, we go away and have a look and come back to you because we want to start with you knowing roughly what it will cost and us knowing how far to go with our research. You can see our contact details there, the website, and you can email info at research through people. And if you want, give me a, give me a phone on my mobile number. I'd be delighted to hear from you.